morning, church. Welcome. It's good to be here with you all this morning. Happy Sunday. Um, happy Palm Sunday. Uh, this morning, we celebrate or remember or whatever words you want to use, um, the time when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And that time, um, it was a kingly role. Like Jesus, in, in, in his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem, he was saying, the king is here, right? We've been waiting and waiting and waiting for, for so long for this heavenly king to arrive, and here I am is what Jesus says. And so I just want to read the story this morning in Matthew 21, uh, verse 1. It says, when they had come near Jerusalem and he had reached Bethphage, I don't know how to say that word, sorry, at the Mount of Olives, that's where he's at. The Mount of Olives doesn't matter the town. Jesus sent two disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you, you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This, they this took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? And I like that question at the end there. Who, who is this? Who are we talking about? And, and this morning, that's who he is. He's the king, right? The king come into our world to rescue us, to, to bring us back to the place where where life was perfect, to bring us back to, to Eden, to bring us back to eternity. That's why Jesus came. And as we celebrate the rest of this week, um, his death and resurrection, that's what it all means, right? It means that that relationship has been restored. It means we have life once again in him. It means that the king is here. So let's pray and worship together this morning. God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for how you've stepped into our world. Um, to bring us back to you, to show us what it means to have a relationship with you, to pour your spirit on us and, and just bring life. Um, and so, God, this morning as we gather together to worship, I pray you would speak to our hearts. However we need to be spoken to, I pray that you would um, reveal areas in our lives where we need to adjust, you know, and just do what only you can do in our hearts this morning. But, God, we're here to remember you, and we thank you for everything that you've done for us. So speak to us. Um, and help us to listen. So God, we love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Normally I would say, let's stand together, but we're not going to stand this morning. We're going to sing and we're going to worship sitting down in our seats so that our uh, sweet little kids can bring in and march through the aisles and bring the palm branches up to the altar. So don't stand, but please sing with us. One, two, ready, and... full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Lord, we lift up your name. Hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name. With hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, 
Full of praise, be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the Full of praise, be exalted, O Lord my God, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise, be exalted, O Lord my God, Hosanna in the It's great to have the kids join in this morning by waving the palm branches. And I pray that all of us are in our minds waving the palm branch in praise to the Lord and for what he has done. So the offering's brought forward. Let's have a word of prayer for the offering. Father God, again, we are thankful and we just praise you. We exalt your holy name. God, uh, maybe we don't have palm branches in our hands this morning, but God, we are praising the Lord, the King, who came into this world to save us of our sins, and we just give you thanks. God, we thank you for all that you've given us. God, everything that we have is a gift from above. We thank you for all your provisions, how you provide for us. Uh, again, you've provided food, clothing, shelter, again, a, a house to live in. Uh, you've given us friends and family. You've given us this church family. You've given us so much that we can be thankful for. So, God, we just give you thanks for all your blessings. And, God, you've called us to give back a portion back to you. And so, God, that's what we want to do is give back our offering back to you, our tithes and our offerings, our 10% and beyond. God, we want to give back to you and just uh, say thank you for all that you've given. And, God, we pray that your kingdom would be furthered. Uh, here in Bremen and all around the world. So God, we want your name to be glorified, that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So God, just take these offerings and multiply them for your kingdom's use. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Okay, at this time, uh, I have a few announcements I want to share with you. Tonight, we do have a service tonight. We have our uh, missionary speaker coming in, Darren and uh, Laura Arnott. Uh, they're here to share with us their ministry, so that's at 6 p.m. tonight. Uh, our regular service on Wednesday night, we have our pre-service meal at 5.30, and then, uh, pre yeah, pre-service meal at 5.30, and our Bible studies at 6.30. Please find a Bible study and come and enjoy that time together around the Word. Thursday night is our prayer nights. Again, it's always good to have people come and join in prayer uh, to our Lord. Uh, mission focus of the month. Each, each month we have a different mission focus. This month is Prairie Camp. Uh, again, think about uh, you kids, uh, parents that have kids. Uh, get them signed up for Prairie Camp this summer. Uh, there is a scholarship available through the men's group. So uh, you can talk with Troy if you uh, desire for your kids to go to Prairie Camp. But if you would like to give towards Prairie Camp, you can mark Prairie Camp and put it in the offering. And you notice that our Easter services, Easter is coming up this week. This is Holy Week as we uh, come into Palm Sunday. Um, we have a Good Friday service at uh, 7 p.m. on Friday. Um, we have communion will be served that night. 
And then next Sunday, we do not have Sunday school next Sunday. We have a breakfast. And again, the men's group is putting on the breakfast. So we want to thank the men's group for putting on that breakfast. That starts at 9 a.m. Uh, next Sunday for Easter breakfast. And then our regular service at 1030 uh, will be our Easter service uh, at the regular time. Uh, men's group, you see that they are selling uh, Nelson's chicken sale again. Um, and that is going to be May 4th from 10 to 2, and the cost is $10, and there are some tickets available so you can get them ahead of time. So you can see uh, Rick, or you can see Troy. Uh, the other men will have uh, the tickets after today, but Rick and Troy have them today if you want to buy some tickets ahead of time. Um, at this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. God, again, we thank you for your great love for us. God, as we celebrate what you did for us, uh, as we celebrate this week of Easter, we celebrate this week of Good Friday, of how you're willing to die a cruel and horrible death upon the cross for us. God, you didn't need to die. You didn't have to die. You, you could have stayed up in heaven and had eternity up in heaven, but you chose you chose to come and die upon the cross so that we could be with you for all eternity. God, we needed you to come, and you did come. And you gave us uh, the greatest gift of all, dying upon the cross. And so, God, we just pray that each one would receive that gift that you have given, that they would know that uh, you died for them personally, and that all they need to do is repent of their sins and turn to you and receive the salvation that's given to them through Christ Jesus our Lord. God, we thank you that, that your death was not the end. We thank you that you conquered the grave. So God, we know that when we die, we will not remain in the grave. We have conquered death through you. That through you, since you have life, we too will have life. And so God, I thank you the scripture is very clear on that. If we're uh, united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. So I thank you for the resurrection that we have through Christ Jesus our Lord. God, and it's not just a resurrection uh, in the future that we have, but it's a new life. It's a resurrection that we have right now, that we have new life in Christ Jesus. We are new people. We are a new creation. And God, help us to live in that abundance that you have provided for us, all the blessings that we have in Jesus, the Holy Spirit that's at work in our midst. God, we uh, uh, want to think of people who are hurting and suffering uh, in our midst. God, I think of uh, Linda Arthur Holtz especially right now as uh, she fell and uh, fractured uh, uh, a bone in a couple different places and and, and also is going to have to put in a pacemaker to help her with her heart. God, we just pray for Linda right now. We pray for her and any pain that she's experiencing right now. We just pray that you would touch her and just uh, bring healing upon those bones. Uh, we just pray for her surgery that she's going to have tomorrow for the pacemaker. God, we just pray that that surgery goes be successful and that she would have more energy because of that pacemaker being put in. God, we thank you for the healing upon her body. And God, I pray for any needs that, are, that we have in our church body here today, whether that's financial needs, whether it's relational needs, uh, physical needs, whatever it may be, Lord God, I just pray that you would minister and work in that. And God, help people to stop and, see, and say, man, I see the Lord is at work in my situation. Thank you that you never leave us or forsake us, but you're always present. God, just be with the rest of our service. Let us bring our praise and let it be worship. Let it be uh, pleasing and, and uh, pleasing in your sight, Lord. We just pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, as the lights come down, would you stand up and we are going to uh, worship together this morning.
we sang this next song and the kids sang it for us so if you remember this kiddos I think you guys did a bunch of motions if you can get us all going in that if you remember it how fun would that be as we're praising the <laughs> Lord I like the idea but I can't do it because my hands are busy so if you can do it praise is rising Oh 
I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes. I see His love and mercy. Washing over all our sin, the people see, the people see. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. this week means. Thankful that you didn't have to do any of it, but you did, because you love us. And what a beautiful gift that is. As we reflect um, on this Holy Week, Lord, we just pray that we would remember who you are and what you've done for us and what that means for our eternity, what that means for us here on earth, Lord. You came so that we would have life and that we would have it abundantly. Lord, that's why you came. You came to save the lost. So would you teach us this week 
would you remind us um, of, of what, what we're to have here on earth, not only uh, that, but, but what we have in eternity with you. Be with us, Lord. Um, we pray for Pastor Kurt as he brings the message. Um, and we just, we give you this day and every day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Again, it's good to see so many kids filing out of here. It's uh, having a lot of kids in our midst, so it's so great. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, John chapter 15. That's where we're going to be looking here today. John 15. Today we celebrate what we know as Palm Sunday. The day that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey to fulfill this Old Testament prophecy that the king is going to come gentle and humble, riding on a donkey, bringing salvation. This kicks off what we know as Holy Week. Starts with the praises of the people as he rides into Jerusalem, and it ends with the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. With a lot that happens in between, uh, we think about Jesus who died upon the cross on uh, the Friday. Uh, Jesus knew he was going to be crucified uh, on the cross. And so today, what I want to look at is some words that he had the night before he was going to be crucified on the cross. Now, it's the night before he's going to be crucified on the cross, so it's not time to talk about how nice the weather is outside or this or that or the other. It's time to talk about some serious things. So we're going to look at, this is Jesus leaving some teachings with the disciples, that they're really going to need in the next 72 hours. And so let's look at John 15, 1 through 8. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. I'm going to stop right there. And the first thing that we need to see here this morning is we need to remain in Jesus to have life. We need to remain in Jesus to have life. These verses really come to light when you think of the context that it's in. Again, like I said, this is the last night before Jesus was going to go to the cross. He just enjoyed the Passover meal with his disciples. He washed their feet. He led them in the Lord's Supper with the the uh, bread and the, and the wine. And the last sentence in verse 14 says, Come now, let us leave. They're leaving the upper room, and they're heading off to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was going to pray. He was going to spend some time in prayer. And this is the place where he was going to be arrested. And as they walk from the upper room, and they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane, obviously they're probably going to see some vines there, and these vines would no doubt uh, begin to blossom. 
And the object lesson was right in front of the disciples to see. Jesus was very good at painting this mental picture in people's minds. And them seeing these vines with fruit would be another way. The theme of this passage jumps out at you. I don't know if you heard it as I read, but the remain in me. Jesus says that four times, only in eight verses. Four times he says, remain in me. He, words, he uses the word remain six times. And if you read on in this passage, he says it several more times. So why is Jesus stressing, remain in me? Why is he, why is he stressing that so much? Because this was the message that the disciples really needed to hear. Within a couple hours, Jesus would be taken from them, and they would have to choose whether or not they're going to follow Jesus or they're going to run away. This night, this weekend, was a critical point for the disciples to choose. Judas, Judas didn't choose to remain in Jesus. Judas uh, went for the things of the world instead of remaining in Jesus. He sold Jesus for 30 co silver coins. And the disciples were all faced with a choice when Jesus was arrested, but they all ran away from Jesus when he was being arrested. And Peter had a choice to remain in Jesus, yet he confessed three times. He says, I don't even know the man. I don't even know who you're talking about. Who is this Jesus? Are they remaining in him? It didn't look like that they were doing a very good job remaining in him. And the question I have for you today is how are you doing in remaining in Jesus? This teaching of remaining in him Every day we have so many choices of following Jesus or following this world, following the material possessions, following this relationship. We can choose Jesus or choose all these material possessions. Possessions. We can choose Jesus or we can choose this bad relationship I know is not good for me. The disciples, they didn't know what they were going to face later that night. They had no clue that Jesus was going to be arrested that night. It surprised them. You know what? Neither do we know what's going to happen later today or tomorrow or later this week. We do not know. We might be facing some tough, difficult situations in our lives in the next little bit. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 26, 41, he says this, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Jesus seems to be telling us that we need to prepare ourselves for things that are going to happen in our lives. We need to build our faith in Him, and then I'll be strong enough to, to handle whatever the world throws at me. So Jesus is crying out to us today, remain in me. Don't be fooled. You're going to have difficult times in your lives. Don't let them get the best of you. Strengthen your faith in me now so that this world, when it tries to tear you down, you'll be strong in me. If we do not remain in him and do not have strength, do not strengthen our faith, we will not be ready for the trials that come our way. The disciples, they had a couple bad days of Jesus being in the tomb. They ran away from Jesus, Jesus being in the tomb, his uh, death and burial. But they did turn back to Jesus and they were willing to follow Jesus. And they were willing to die for him. They were willing to do that because they had a strong relationship with Jesus. Maybe a few people here today, maybe there's some people here today that have strayed a little bit in their walk with the Lord. Things have come up in your life and you've been hiding out doing other things. Now is the time to turn back and live for Jesus. Get back to remaining in Him. Verse 5 says here, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. We all know that a branch has to remain in the vine to stay alive. If it's cut away, if you separate the branch from the vine, it's going to die. 
It, it depends on the, the vine to get its nutrients, the very life from the vine. So Jesus is saying that you need to be dependent upon me. You need to be dependent on me for life. Be connected with him. In the chapter right before this, one of the very famous verses of Scripture, John 14, 6, Jesus, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I hope we see today that our sin has separated us from God. All of our, we, we got sins in our lives. All of us have been separated from God. And we need to remain in Him if we want to go to heaven and have eternal life. Jesus says, I am the only way to eternal life. Life is only in me. you got to be in the vine if you want life. There's an interesting point about the vine and branches. That a branch will never, a branch will never become independent of the vine. And I love that illustration because Jesus didn't use the illustration of a young child. You think about this. Think of a child when it is conceived. They are totally dependent upon their mother in the womb. For eight, nine months, they're completely dependent uh, for nourishment in the mother's womb. For some time, they are dependent on the mom for food to eat after they get out of the womb. But once the child is weaned, it eventually starts becoming more and more independent. And pretty soon that child doesn't need the mother anymore. They can function without the mother. That's why Jesus didn't use that illustration right there. But Jesus used the illustration of a, a, a branch, a vine and a branch. Because let me tell you, a branch will be as completely dependent for nutrients from the vine when it's 50 years old as it is when it's one year old. The branch always, the branch always needs the vine. Just like we will always, we will always need Jesus. There won't be a time where we'll grow out of that. Oh, I've been a Christian for 50 years, so I guess I don't need Jesus as much. Anymore. No, we're always going to need Jesus. Jesus makes it very clear that life is in Him and Him alone. You can't substitute anything for the vine. you got to have the vine. There's no substitute for being connected to Jesus. If you are not connected to Jesus, look at what happens. Verse 6 here. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. That right there is not a pretty picture. This is a picture of hell. And I know people don't want to talk about hell anymore. We don't want to say anything about that. But hell is real. And if we do not bear fruit for God, we are going to be thrown in to hell. I think this is a very big warning for us that are not bearing fruit. But we're just kind of playing religion. We're just kind of playing religion. That's what we do. But Jesus over and over again accused the Pharisees the religious leaders of just being religious but not bearing any fruit, not turning to Him. These people were in the temple all the times. They were reading their Bibles. They gave the required money, but they didn't have a change of attitude in their lives. The question is, do we have a change of attitude in our life? We need to develop a love for God, not a I know God exists kind of a thing, but a love for God in our lives. We need to, to, to commune with God daily. Jesus says we're to remain in Him. You are in me now. That's what He's saying. Is you guys are in me now. Remain in me. Jesus is giving us a picture that He is the main thing, the main ingredient. You can't make anything without this main ingredient. Our lives are nothing if we don't have Jesus in them. Verse 4 says, No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
And it goes on in the end of verse 5 again. It says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is not beating around the bush here. Jesus is not hinting at something here. Jesus comes flat out and he says, if you want eternal life, if you want life, you want a fruitful life here on earth, you have to remain in me. Jesus is where life comes from. Have you ever turned on a faucet and you're holding the hose and no water comes out of it only to see that the hose is not hooked up to the faucet? Oh, man. The, the, the source, there's nothing wrong with the source. The water's coming out of it. The problem is it's, the hose is not hooked up. So the source is flowing. Jesus is continuing to flow. The question is, are we hooked into him? Have we remained in him? Well, let's move on to the second thing here today. second thing we see here today is God prunes our lives so that they can be more fruitful. God prunes our lives so it can be more fruitful. If you are bearing fruit for God, that is great. I'm thankful that you're bearing fruit for God. That should be the goal of every Christian is to bear fruit for the Lord. But don't stop there. You have not reached your full potential yet. As long as we're on this earth, we haven't reached our full potential yet. Christians are often too satisfied with bearing some fruit and not continuing to, to uh, think about the potential that they do have. Verse 2 says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. You know, I wish this wasn't the case, but we carry over into our Christian lives a lot of our old life uh, that is not very Christ-like into our Christian lives. We brought a lot of sinful luggage into our relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know what? He accepts us in, in, our, in His grace. He doesn't expect us, hey, clean yourself up, then come back. Be clean before you come to me. No, Jesus is like, I accept you as you are. And then He starts to prune us. He welcomes us even though we have these sinful traits, these dead branches in our lives. But through the process of sanctification, God is cutting out the old man. He's cutting out the old person of our lives. He's starting to clean us up. He prunes us. It doesn't happen all of a sudden or once and for all. He prunes us once and for all and we're done. But it takes a whole lifetime for him to, to prune us. He continually over and over again prunes us. He does it repeatedly. He does it often. Slowly and surely God's word is at work in our hearts cleansing us from the bad as we start bearing more and more and more fruit in our lives. You know a gardener prunes the same plant year after year after year. God continually prunes our, and cleanses our lives from the things that do not bear fruit for his kingdom's purpose. Everywhere you look, everywhere you look on the tree, it should be bearing fruit. Everywhere you look on a tree should be bearing fruit. If one side of the tree is bearing fruit and another side is not bearing fruit, there's a problem. Every branch should be bearing fruit. There should, be, there should not be a branch that is not bearing fruit. Likewise, there should be no area of our life that's not bearing fruit. And if it's not bearing fruit, it needs to be pruned so that area of your life will bear the fruit. And the thing is, if we're honest with ourselves, we all have areas where we need a little cut. We need a little pruning. We need a little uh, God coming and working in our hearts and our lives. Get rid of the unproductive stuff to make room for the good. If we hold back certain areas from our, uh, of our lives from God, that keeps us from truly knowing Him better. John 8, 32 says this. Jesus says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I am sure you've heard those verses be, that verse before, the truth will set you free. But there's a, an important verse ahead of it. How do we know the truth? How do we know the truth? Uh, verse 31, right before that one, it says, 
to the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, if, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Do you hear that? If, if you hold to my teaching, then, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's this if and then statement. If you hold to my teachings, then you will know the truth. You will experience the freedom. We are to hold to his teachings first, and then we experience the freedom. We would like it the other way around to experience freedom first, and then it would be easier to obey him. Some of us have accepted Jesus into our lives, and he's brought us freedom uh, in different areas of our lives. But we are still bound to sin in other areas of our lives. Certain areas of our lives, we are still not ready to give control back to God. We still hold on to what we think is best. God wants to come and take these bad habits out of our lives and replace them with good habits. He wants to prune us. He wants to set us free to become more healthier and more fruitful. You know, I want you to see God doesn't prune us to hurt us. God prunes us to help us so we can bear more fruit. His word seems hard to follow, but he definitely knows the best design for our lives. You know, we can hold tightly to some things in our lives because we think that we are wiser and that we know better than God. Not that we'd ever say that out loud, that, that, uh, that I'm wiser than God's word is. You know, I know my situation. You know, if I hold on to more money, I will have more. But the opposite is true. Tithing gives you more. Think of tithing like pruning. Let me describe pruning just briefly here for you. You prune to cut back the bad to make more room for the good, to get more nutrients from the, what's going to the bad, get more nutrients into the good. Sounds logical. But here comes a, maybe what may be a little bit more illogical to people. You also may need to get rid of some of the good buds of a tree so that more nutrients go to the other good buds of the tree. So let me just say, I have a, a hundred buds of what's going to be apples coming out uh, of the tree. I may have to prune back 50 of these good uh, buds so that instead of having a hundred good apples on a tree, I prune back to only have 50. But you know what? Those 50 are, instead of the 100 being very small apples, I mean, being very small apples, you're going to have uh, 50 apples that are huge. So pound-wise, you're going to have more apples if you prune. Because the more nutrients are going to those 50, 50 apples. Uh, so there's more fruit in 50 than there is 100. That doesn't sound logical to some people. Some people think, I would rather have 100 but I'd rather have 50 big apples with more fruit on them than 100 with small apples on them. That, you know, so again, to most people, 100 apples sounds far better than 50 apples. That's because you don't understand the principle of pruning. Once I understand the, about the principle of pruning, I'm willing to do it. If I don't understand the principle of pruning, I will hold as many apples as I can. Because I want many apples. I don't think we Christians understand how God wants to prune us. What seems illogical to us, God takes and prunes so there will be even more fruit that comes into our lives. Being willing to sacrifice and go for big fruit in your life. Don't stay as you are in your life and be content with small fruit. God wants to bring freedom in all areas of your life. I mentioned tithing here just right now, but that's just one area. There may be things in your life that are not necessarily bad, but God wants to come and prune and just make, a, uh, just make room for other things in your life. Every branch has stuff that needs to go. Think about that. Every branch has stuff that, that needs to go. We never get to the point on this earth that we don't have any impurities anymore and that there's nothing that we need to get rid of. Whether you've been a Christian for five minutes or you've been a Christian for 50 years, you are still in need of the pruning knife. You are still in need of God coming and cutting away different things in your life. 
Well, let's move on to the application here today. The application, God gets the glory. God gets the glory. we got to learn that we have to remain in Christ if we want to bear fruit. If He's not in your life, you're not going to bear fruit. Verse 5 says, you can do nothing. You know, I have a plastic glove here in my pocket, and everybody walks around with a plastic glove in their pocket, right? It's not just me. Uh, I have a plastic glove in my pocket, and if I would tell this plastic glove, I would say, plastic glove, pick up this pen. Would it pick up the pen? No, it doesn't. I tell the plastic glove, draw a circle. It's not doing it. I tell the plastic glove to wave to the crowd. Wave to the crowd. It doesn't do it. It's not happening. Now, look at what happens if I put my hand into this plastic glove. And I say, pick up the pen. I say, draw a circle. There it is. Wave to the crowd. The plastic glove. The plastic glove's doing it. Right? Right? Who's doing it? It's my hand in the plastic glove that's doing it. Now, I take the plastic glove off again. I say, now do those things again. It's not doing it. So who gets the glory for doing those things? Is it the glove that gets the glory for waving and doing it? No. What gets the glory is the hand that was in it. And that's the same thing in our lives. Is God's hand, we're the plastic glove. We are... We're useless. We, we, we can't do anything of eternal value without His hand being in us and directing us in that. And so we get, so who gets the credit for it? It's God's hand in us as we're doing good works for the Lord. Verse 8 says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. The glory goes to God when we bear fruit and do things for His kingdom. If you hear a good sermon, the pastor doesn't get the glory. The glory goes to God because you are going out and putting into practice the word that was preached. Some may think that bearing fruit is hard. That only super Christians can bear fruit. But there's nothing farther from the truth. Bearing fruit is not hard. It's not for super Christians. It's for each and every person. All that a tree, all the branch has to do is to remain in the vine and it will bear fruit. Same way with us. The only requirement for a branch is to remain connected to the vine. We must stay connected to our vine, read the word, and be in prayer, and the fruit of God will be undoubtedly displayed in our lives. Let me give you an example that kind of puts you in God's shoes for a second. Say you planted a, a bunch of tomato plants, and you go, you go out there and you're anxious to get tomatoes off these tomato plants, and you go out there and all you see is beautiful green tomato plants, but no tomatoes on there. Will that satisfy you? Wow, I grew a bunch of beautiful green tomato plants. I am so glad. I doubt that's going to be what you think. You didn't plant the tomato plants to get the plant, but to get to fruit. In our Christian walk, we have gotten content just having a plant and not being uh, concerned about the fruit. Are we content just coming to church? Are we content uh, just listening to the Christian radio station, but, not, but making no behavioral changes in our lives? That we have this plant but we have no fruit that comes from that. If you are not bearing fruit, you're not doing what you are called to be doing. Uh, Luke 13, 6 through 8. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree, planted his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, 
Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. So the guy was looking for fruit on the fruit tree. God doesn't want a Christian in name only. He wants, us, he wants one that is out there remaining in him and bearing fruit for his kingdom. When God comes to look for fruit in your life, does he find any fruit in your life? Again, tomato plants are useless if they don't have tomatoes on them. This glove is useless if it doesn't have a hand inside of it. Christians are useless if they are not bearing Christ-like fruit in their lives. You know, this sermon is about spending time with God, remaining in Him. There should be a hunger inside of us to be with God. The psalmist in 16.2, Psalm 16.2, says, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. He says, I need you. We will not bear fruit in our lives if we do not spend time with God. We need to set apart time for God. We often are very busy in our lives and we say, you know what? I will spend time with God when I get around to it. But how often we don't get around to it. We need to set time aside and say, I am going to spend time with God. We should develop such a relationship with Jesus that we would miss our time if we didn't get to spend it time with Him. When we love someone, we want to spend time with them. Do we love the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we want to spend time with Him? We need to rekindle that love that we have for our Lord. We need to rekindle that. There's a quote that I saw one time that said, it, 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 even if Jesus was born a thousand times in Bethlehem, if he hasn't been born in me, I'm still lost. I love that quote. Jesus could have been born a thousand times in Bethlehem. If he hasn't been born in me, I am lost. The fact that Jesus came to the earth does us no good if we do not embrace the truth and live in it. We need to receive the relationship that he desires us to have with him. Without him, we are nothing and we can do nothing. Let me read verse 5 again. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So is it possible to remain in him and at the same time him to remain in us? Several years ago, there was a blacksmith giving his testimony to a man who was at his shop. He ended by saying, I'm so glad that Christ is in me and I, in it, I am in him. The next day, the, the guy came back to the blacksmith shop and said, I've been thinking. I don't think it's possible for you to be in Christ and for Christ to be in you at the same time. At that time, the blacksmith had a horseshoe in the fire and he asked the man, is the horseshoe in the fire? And the man said, yes, the horseshoe is in the fire. Then the blacksmith took the horseshoe out, and you could tell it was all red, and, uh, there was, and the man held it up again. He said, is the horseshoe in the fire, or is the fire in the horseshoe? And the man was like, oh, I see the fire's in the horseshoe now. He made his point. The horseshoe was affected by the fire as it sat in the fire for some time. The fire remained in the horseshoe. Do you think that horseshoe would have fire if the blacksmith only put it in for one second and pulled it out? It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have the fire in that horseshoe. Same way with our lives. How often do we think about, oh, I come to church. We give one hour of our whole week to church. If we do that, and we want Christ to dwell in us. We spend time with Christ, it affects us. In the Old Testament is the story of Moses spending time. Uh, in Exodus 34, 29, it says this, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two, two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. 
Do you understand that, G, that Moses spent time with the Lord, and he spent so much time with the Lord that he came down and his face showed that he spent time with the Lord. This happened many times. Each time Moses spoke with the Lord, his face would become radiant. The people knew without a shadow of a doubt that Moses had been with God. And you know what? It should be the same way in our lives. When we spend time with God, people should be able to tell we've been with God. Because it changes us. It changes who we are. People should be able to tell that we are different. We are not lifeless. We're not lifeless like this glove or a branch. But we bear much fruit for God. We display the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We have those in our lives. Our lives are radiating in this dark world. So I wanted you to go back to this horse sto uh, horseshoe story I told. When the horseshoe has the fire in it, that horseshoe can be formed. Because when it's hot, it can be formed. The blacksmith can hammer out any problem spots. When we have Christ in us, when we remain in Him, you know what He can do to us? He can form us. Because He's in us. He wants to form us to be uh, fruit-bearing Christians for Himself. But what we need to do is remain in Him. And again, if you spend time with a lot of people, sometimes you take on their characteristics. And so if we spend time with Jesus, we're going to take on his characteristics. So at this time, I'm going to ask the praise team to come forward. And they're going to lead us in our closing song. There may be days in our lives where it's hard to remain in Jesus. There may be situations we find ourselves in that makes it hard to remain in Jesus. But as we practice remaining in Jesus, it's going to become natural to us. We will desire to spend time with God to feed the spirit that, that he, that's inside of us. We will grow to have a desire that we want a closer walk with Jesus. You know, again, if God has spoken to you today and that you want to be a fruit-bearing Christian, that God has put it upon your heart, man, I want to bear fruit. I want to remain in Him. God is, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Come forward as we sing this song. Let's stand and sing just a closer walk with thee.
Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for the price that was paid on our behalf. That we can um, with you daily, moment by moment, you want us to walk with you. God, we thank you that we got a God who's so uh, concerned for us and wants to walk with us. God, we understand from today's passage that we can do nothing on our own. God, we are like this glove. It just lays there. It cannot do anything unless your hand is in us. And that, God, you would get all the glory. Glory for the good things that happen in our lives. So, God, I pray that you go with us. God, help us to be fruit-bearing Christians. God, we don't want to just be a, a tomato plant. We just don't want to be a Christian in name only. But we want to bear fruit for your kingdom. We want uh, your uh, love and joy and peace and uh, the fruit of the Spirit. We want to see that come out in our lives. So, God, just do a mighty work in us and change us from the inside out. God, help people see that we have been with Jesus because of the, uh, how our life is displayed. God, I pray that you go with us now. Help us to walk in obedience to you. Then we'll know your truth, and the truth will set us free. So we thank you, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may go in peace. Have a great day.